Welcome to Today's Entrepreneur, a program about the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Quebec business, presented by FL Montreal. Dan Delmar and Mike Newton with you today. Good afternoon, Mike. Hey, Dan. How are you? Excellent. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Very excited about today's show because we really do have a titan of Quebec Inc. with us this week. And not just Quebec Inc., but Quebec Inc. 2.0, someone who's really helped push forward the conversation on not only Quebec tech, but Quebec entrepreneurship. He's been described rightfully as an inspirational figure in Quebec. Louis Tetsu is with us today. Yeah, it is an individual who has, uh, you know, acted in, in many capacities uh, since he started his first business back in like 1990. But he certainly continues to fund as an angel investor. And a lot of those entities are still within Quebec, which is a little bit rare. Most of the time we see a lot of that capital after it's been made being sent elsewhere. But, uh, but Louis has been very committed to, uh, to the local market. It's not every day we have the head of a public company on the show and one that went public recently. So he'll talk about taking Coveo public. They do uh, AI assisted platforms for for e-commerce for retailers. And uh, previously he created Taleo. Um, He and and the same group of three co-founders have been working together for 30 years. So he created Taleo, which is more of an office sort of HR management software um, uh, application. They sold to Oracle maybe 15 uh, or so years ago, and now he's he's heading Coveo. He's just a really impressive serial entrepreneur. And we'll also talk about estates and trusts on the program later with Sarah Halleckman of FL Fuller Landau. But first, diving into our thought leadership segment, Mike. And uh, when we talk about um, finding success and finding purpose, um, this is something that I think Louis uh, will will touch on. Um, they think about this uh, at, uh, at their business a lot. They certainly write about it. Um, Purpose, I said on a recent show, is going to be the 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 key business communications word of maybe the next year. You know, whereas resilience may have been the word for the previous year. We are resilient. We've made it. Now what? So there's a couple of things at play here, and and you know we will we'll we'll talk about this with Louis a bit later. Is you know the, our, our our bottom line evaluation continues to change in business, and you know for the longest time it was dollars and cents. It was clear, and obviously on the on the capital markets and taking a company public, you know the bottom line is still the the driver of a stock price. But with the employees and with your team, I think you know part of this is is twofold. One is purpose, and the other is accountability. And you know the 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 purpose of of, of an entrepreneur, or the purpose even of an employee goes. A long way in building commitment and building passion in, in what you're doing. And, and if you don't have purpose, then, you know, it's very hard to be committed. And, and I have to tell you that I think a lot of people have not really spent the time or hadn't pre-COVID. I don't know if they spent the time COVID since they've been home and they've had a little more time uh, to determine what their purpose is in life and, and, and what it is that they want to do and what emphasis, what emphasis they want to place on that. And can they find a business environment that matches their purpose or are these two, are these two you know, congruent or are they going to be incongruous for the rest of their careers? And I think that's going to be a big challenge for a lot of people. And, and and I think you have to take into account, you know, who are the key relationships in your life uh, inside and outside of work in terms of finding that purpose. And, and, you know, if you're going to spend 12 or 14 hours a day at the office or you're going to spend it at your home office, you still need to have, you know, what you're doing. And a lot of people, certainly the younger generation, wants to focus uh, on more than just work. Now, that some of them can do it through work. You can find a way in, in ESG, you can find a way to create a culture and a way to give back within the business. If you can meld those two together, then your purpose and your business are aligned. If not, how does that now play into the time and the energy that you spend in work and the ability for you to do things uh, outside of? And how do you find that meaningful craft in personal and professional life? Purpose has always been like uh, too much of a consideration for me. I think in the early days, it's in my logo. It's the two opposing speech bubbles. You know, I, I talk a lot about my family history, even on my business's website. And and now I think is a really, really great time for entrepreneurs who have may, probably spent too much time philosophizing as I have to really put their themselves out there because we're at a we're at a point I think in history where where conversations are breaking down a little bit. And I think uh, now is a pretty good time. Whereas people may have been shy in the last couple of years and under, under the pandemic and all that, I think now's a really good time for an activist entrepreneur to come out a little bit. 
Yeah, I think you got to be careful to a certain degree that the pendulum doesn't swing completely the other way. And we go from having no social conscience to having nothing but a social conscience. I, I think we have to, like everything else, we have to find that that balance in what we're doing. Uh, you know, for a lot of people, uh, you know, purpose is is what drives them, it what gears them. If they if they happen to get lucky, lucky to be able to meld that with a business, then there's a way to make money that allows the money to be the, the continue the purpose. For a lot of people, it's the purpose that then continues the money or the money that continue. You know, I mean, you've got this constant battle going on, uh, depending, I guess, maybe on what generation and and, and how you see things. Um, the concern is, is, you know, how realistic is the purpose and making an impact if you can't find a way to make money while you're doing it too. And I know that, you know, there's a lot of people rolling their eyes at me making that statement, but unfortunately, a lot of the things that we want to do that make a difference in the world are going to require us to have some kind of uh, a business imprint, uh, unless you just happen to inherit a whole lot of money. I'm a big believer in effective altruism. So the the when people ask me this from a PR perspective, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, how do I uh, give away more of myself? I just say, just do it. Just give away more of your expertise. Do whatever you do best for free once in a while for for those in need. It's just that simple. Yeah, and I think there's a there's a huge generational difference in this thought process where I think a lot of uh, you know my generation. Uh, worked hard, built wealth so that they could then give back to the community. And that was part of, hey, the community has been good to us. Now let's be good to the community, where I think the younger generation is almost starting off on the other foot saying, I want to make an impact in my community early on. And how do I get there doing what I need to do? So it, it creates a very interesting uh, you know, discussion and, and it goes back to, you know, what is your definition of, uh, of a bottom line? And I think uh, we're going to continue to struggle with that for some time. So holding yourself accountable to your purpose, to your goals. This is from HBR. Uh, three big tips here. One, enlist an accountability partner. Two, go public in declaring and sharing your goals. And three, change your environment. Yeah, look, there's no doubt that uh, an individual is much easier or much more accountable when they when they know that somebody else is watching. They feel this sense of responsibility. I mean, the oldest story in the book is, you know, if I, if I tell you I'm going to meet you to go jogging at 6 a.m. and you're and I know you're going to be there, I'll show up. If I say I'm going to set my alarm for 6 a.m. and jog by myself, guess what I'm not going to do tomorrow morning. So, you know, the reality is, is it falls into we as human beings sometimes need somebody to to hold us accountable. Find the right person. Find the person that makes you feel like, hey, you're doing the job. You're getting things done. Enough of a, you know, kick in the butt to make sure that you follow what you need to do, but not to the point where that, you know, accountability partner becomes degrading and, and, and you know, uh, it has a negative effect on what you're doing. And again, once you go public and once you share your goals is exactly the same thing. If I say I'm committed to do something, then I know people are counting on it. There's this automatic accountability that's created the moment I say, it out loud. If I keep it inside, the only person I'm accountable to is myself. And not that that's a bad thing, because I think you still have to be accountable to yourself at the end of the day. My father told me for years, son, you're the only one that's looking in the mirror at the end of the day. So you're only accountable to yourself. But the same token, the more that I say it aloud, the more I put it out there for other people, the more now I've got people that are relying on me to be accountable. And the more that affects them, the more that I need to make sure that I, I stick to what I've said. HBR has another interesting piece here on accountability. Does your team have an accountability problem? How can you diagnose that? How do you uh, how do you tell if uh, you as a leader or your some of your your executives or your uh, most most key employees um, how how can you tell if they have an accountability issue? Dan, I think this is going to be one of the biggest issues that we are going to face in the next 12 to 18 months is this sense of accountability um, with everyone and and is our team being accountable? The, you know, the whole COVID work from home, isolation, fear factor has created a very different thought process. You know, we've talked in the past about change of paradigms. We've talked about, you know, where things may be headed. I think right now we have a problem. And I think that problem is being going back to being accountable. And is our team accountable not only to the business, but are they accountable to their team members? Are they accountable to their, you know, the, the, their teammates that are sitting next to them? Uh, and one of the things that we find, and and, and it really is, and, and it's a difficult issue that to address. But you know, as as me looking for you to be accountable to me, Dan, have I been clear about what my expectations are? Uh, have I asked what I can do to help? How am I helping to participate in your accountability? So if we go back to the previous you know, article, we were talking about, hey, once I say it aloud, it now becomes real. So how is my involvement in your accountability help? And we have a terrible tendency to kind of sit on our hands and say, well, people aren't accountable. I think the biggest issue really, it, 
is self-awareness in, in, in all of these issues. And if you can recognize that you're playing a role, if you recognize that you're accountable to other people, you know, I've used the term a few times in the last month or so that I think what we're looking at right now is a bunch of navel gazers as we come out of, uh, uh, you know, out of COVID. And, and, and I think that you have to be self-aware. I think you have to recognize that, the, you know, the world is no longer about me. When we were in lockdown and we were doing what we could to protect our families and do whatever, I mean, obviously that created a very different uh, outlook on the world. And, and as I said, it, it, it's a bit of a navel gazing uh, approach to life. It's inward looking. We need to go back to being outward looking. And whether that's in our communities, whether that's in our jobs, we need to be held, held accountable, not just to a few people around us. We need to be held accountable to the community and to the society again. And I think this is an area that it's going to take some time for us to to break ground and, and and get traction with again because I feel that there is a lack of accountability right now and that is top to bottom in every organization. Some people have shone throughout this whole scenario and other people need to wake back up again and find out where their place lies and how they now stand in terms of being accountable to the team around them. We cannot reemerge if one or two people are going to do it themselves. Real quick on the mechanics or the logistics of accountability, Mike, uh, I, you know, we've talked about this before. I'm not a fan of Slack, you know, notifications, pestering employees to hand stuff in and, and whatnot. What, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs who just want to implement some kind of process for this? It's, it's communication. It's talking. It's, it's getting the teams together. It's, you know, we're all, let's face it, we're all video conferenced out at this point. Uh, at some point, we will hopefully be back to face to face again, but we need that communication. And the most important aspect is we need to be clear in what we need people to be participating in. And if I sit back and I look at this and I go, hey, you know what, so and so is not being accountable. And all I do is stick my head in the sand. I'm as much of a problem as they are. You know, we need to be addressing it. We need to find a way to have an open dialogue uh, on issues that are probably going to be a little tenuous for some time as, as people try and find their way back to things. So I think it revolves around communication. I think it revolves around, you know, the, the expect setting expectations. Um, and, I, and I think that's a very difficult thing right now for people to do is to set those expectations. They're afraid to be too aggressive or not aggressive enough. And our special guest is the co-founder of a company that was uh, bought by Oracle is called Taleo, and he is currently the CEO of Coveo, uh, which recently went public. It's an AI-powered platform for digital experiences. And when we talk about Quebec Inc. Uh, 2.0, uh, Louis Tetsu is certainly at the head of the pack. So first, the simplest question, please, what is Coveo? Well, Coveo is a, is a software company. Uh, we're about uh, 750 employees and, uh, and growing, and as you mentioned, now a public company. And what we do essentially is we provide a platform to uh, businesses, mostly uh, large global enterprises, that uh, helps them use their data alongside with artificial intelligence to personalize their digital experiences. So that applies to commerce. Think about your commerce experiences, your customer service experiences. When you go on websites, how do you make that experience personal? A little bit like a Netflix would do for you. Uh, you know, once they ask you, you know, who's watching, they assemble content that's just for you. So when you apply artificial intelligence to, to areas such as commerce, for instance, or customer service, um, you, there are significant benefits both for the consumer as well as um, the enterprise. And that also applies to the workplace. So essentially, uh, we're pretty much the leader in, um, on, a global, on the global scene uh, in that technology. How did you initially get involved in Coveo? What's, uh, you know, I mean, obviously there's a bit of history and we'll get into a little bit later in terms of your, uh, your background, but how did you start in Coveo? I met people much smarter than I who had started the business and uh, Coveo was kind of an offspring of a company in, uh, in Quebec named Copernic Technologies, which had been founded by Laurent Simoneau, Richard Tessier and uh, Marc Sanfasson. And, uh, and basically, uh, I was still uh, chairman of, of Taleo uh, in the U.S., at uh, the time, which was also a software company, a public software company on the NASDAQ. And I became the uh, angel investor uh, in Coveo in 2008. And uh, initially the chairman working with Laurent and et cetera. And uh, when uh, Oracle Corporation bought uh, Taleo, Laurent asked me to come and, uh, and work with him. Uh, and since I'm a an extremely bad golfer and all I know is software, I decided to join him in the journey, which has been uh, uh, wonderful. 
Interesting. So you go back to, I guess we'll do a little bit of history, but I guess you're a 1985 grad of University of Laval with an engineering degree. Uh, so you've pretty much been dabbling in the, in the, in the tech world for uh, quite a few years now. Uh, you had uh, your first company. It was a 1990 software company um, that eventually, I guess you 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 played the tech bubble a little bit in that time frame. So give us a little bit of experience, maybe as to how that company started uh, and uh, what it was like to, to to come up in the 90s in the tech world. Right. Well, uh, I would say it was a little bit by accident, but it was related to the to my family. Uh, you know, I graduated in uh, in engineering and uh, mechanical engineering, and actually with uh, a goal to be in aerospace engineering, and uh, had you know followed some aerodynamics specialty and etc. And uh, became a helicopter pilot actually at the time, and uh, my brother had started a. Uh, a company uh, in industrial engineering software and uh, in uh, 1989 asked me uh, to join and uh, subsequently my, you know, two guys who are still my partners here at Coveo Jean Lavigar and Guy Gauvin. So we've been now working together for 32 years and, uh, you know, we were, I guess, um, uh, too young to be uh, to be fearful and uh, didn't have a lot of responsibilities and, uh, you know, ended up growing a software company that, uh, you know, when when I was, uh, you know, 26 year old, uh, you know, had some uh, some offices in uh, South America, Mexico, uh, the Netherlands, Australia, Germany. And uh, we merged that company with a Dutch company um, named the Bond Software, which, uh, you know, went public on the NASDAQ in uh, 1995. So, you know, we were kind of fortunate. Uh, sometimes in life, things happen and you just have to be there um, and say yes, I guess. And, uh, you know, so we had an amazing ride at Bond. The company was growing very quickly and uh, we had global operations and so on. So we learned at a very young age uh, how, to, how to play on the global technology scene, most, mostly in the enterprise software space. And, um, and then in 1999, uh, we wrote the business plan for Toleo. In Quebec for the last 20 years has been really an incredible boom. I mean, we're really a tech center and, and it's certainly an AI center around the world. Um, what's in the water? What's in the education system? What are we doing right in the space? Well, we're doing a lot of things right. Uh, you know, we have things to improve as well. Uh, but, you know, we've um, been able to, um, you know, uh, produce an education system and uh, a research environment that has produced some great talent. Um, have we really made the most of that talent, uh, you know, to build uh, you know, wealth in here in Quebec and Canada, as opposed to being the, the low cost engineering branch of the world that frankly uh, could be debatable. Uh, you know, whether the produce of our education system is really contributing to building more Shopify's and more Coveo's and, uh, you know, more light speeds and new vies and others. Uh, but, you know, hey, uh, you know, uh, we're here with uh, still um, quite a lot of, um, of, of talent and uh, know-how that we're now learning, um, you know, and, and we're now learning to build, uh, you know, global technology players that can be leaders on the global scene and uh, Canadian-owned. And, uh, you know, that, I think that's a good thing. So I grew up through the whole, that whole technology environment. Uh, and growth. And I have to tell you that uh, for many, many years, I've thought that the technology growth in Montreal has been a little bit like the old Montreal Expos were as kind of a feeder system for the rest of uh, Major League Baseball. And I think technology has done that. We've had great <coughs> R&D and great growth programs, but have not been able to keep the talent and the and the money in Montreal. So, yeah. Well, it's been it's been the policy of uh, I know this is this is a maybe getting off topic, but this is it's been the policy of our governments, uh, you know, for two decades, uh, you know, to go, you know, uh, uh, elsewhere in foreign countries and uh, in fact, even pay companies to come here and hire our talent. And so now we're obviously seeing the effect of that because we need technology talent everywhere and there's a shortage in Canada. So look, companies like Coveo and what we've been trying to do is, is, to, is to revert that and, um, and, and basically hopefully that can uh, maybe inspire 
uh, others that we can uh, build. It's not about attracting Amazon in Canada. It's about it's about building Amazon and other Amazon or something like that, whatever, whether it's the size of Amazon or not, that doesn't matter. Uh, but it's about building an owner's economy. And, uh, and, you know, we're very proud as a team. And I think we should be and our employees should be that, you know, we can show, you know, that, uh, that this is possible, that we can, um, you know, raise the capital um, here in the country and, uh, and build uh, companies who are truly global technology leaders as Coveo is, because we are a leader in their space, in, that, in our space. Name a company in Silicon Valley um, you know, in the tech world, uh, there's a very, very high probability, you know, certainly more than 50% that there are a Coveo customer. And uh, so we're very proud of that. Louis, just to, to continue in that thought, I mean, obviously, in order for us to maintain the talent and the quality, we need the serial entrepreneurs like yourself who are continuing to invest in the province as well as reinvest in the province. And, and I think the fascinating aspect of, you know, the the, the multiple uh, organizations you've, you've started and, and continue to run is that element. I mean, we lose so many of the entrepreneurs to, I guess, I don't know if it's a greater environment uh, when they leave Quebec, but not, not a lot of them stay. And it's, uh, you know, I applaud you for the time and the effort and the energy that you continue to pump back in. And it's, you know, it's one thing to make the money. It's another thing to continue to be an angel and, and, and move forward like you did with Coveo. Well, thank you. No, there's, and, and there's, there, there's so much talent here, you know, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty active in a, in a number of uh, startups and uh, bigger companies, bigger tech companies uh, on the local scene, you know, and uh, there's some amazing talent, you know, I'm involved in the, a company named Vention uh, with Etienne Lacroix in Montreal as the CEO. You guys should interview Etienne. He's one of the best. Um, Patrick Gilbert at Pedal MD, you know, he's probably got a, one of the best medical platforms in the world uh, on, on, um, on the internet. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's many others and, uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's just a matter of, um, of, of changing the strategy and, uh, you know, entrepreneurs are people who, um, you know, wake up in the morning with, um, and, and, and refuting the status quo, I guess, and, uh, and, and taking action, uh, you know, it's one thing to complain or talk about what should be done. Entrepreneurs, I think, are people who just, uh, you know, um, uh, proceed and, uh, and, and take action to change things and uh, take initiative. And, uh, and that's what we try to encourage, uh, you know, uh, our employees, uh, you know, and uh, we have a certain value system um, to build these companies and that we think is important for success in any business, um, you know, and uh, that, that we care about. And uh, Louis, you went public recently. Um, now, not the first time you've done that. After the second, third time, is it a little less nerve wracking? Because it just seems to me like the most nerve wracking process any business owner could, could go through. It's definitely a lot of work. Uh, and uh, and uh, you have to take that work uh, very seriously and uh, be prepared for it and so on. I would say uh, nerve wracking, no. Uh, you know, you go public, um, you know, first of all, going public is never a destination, should never be. And unfortunately, you hear in some of the narrative of entrepreneurs sometimes or even investors that, you know, it's it's almost feels like a destination. Um, going public is actually the end of the beginning. It's the end of the beginning uh, for a company. It's fundamentally a milestone. It's a finance. It's a financing event. Um, and um, and you do that because you see a path to growth and uh, investor return and kind of a long term view that, you know, you get to a point and, and the size and a stature, I guess, in your industry where, you know, it makes sense you know, for a certain set of reasons to be a public company and access the public markets for capital. Um, and, and you're prepared for that. This is, this is an event that you should never, you, sh you should always be prepared to continue as a private company. And, um, you know, I always uh, compare it, um, you know, to, uh, I'm, I'm a hiker. I like to hike on weekends and, uh, you know, uh, mountains and stuff. And uh, there's, there's, Two metaphors that I think I, I always uh, use, just because I happen to know that a little bit. 
Um, the first one is that, you know, uh, the journey in business, uh, and it, it applies to business, the journey is always much more important than the destination. So if you focus on the journey, um, you know, ultimately the destination actually tends to get better. Um, you know, and, and, and that's always been our philosophy, never to seek to be a public company or et cetera as a goal, but it's really along the Covell journey and the growth you know, raising capital and so on. We raised uh, 247 million, um, which is is something that we know what to do with, right? And uh, we can invest in the business and continue to grow globally. My second and my second uh, metaphor I use as it relates to hiking is it's amazing how high you can go one step at a time when you right, when you when you climb a mountain and uh, at your own pace. And uh, that's a philosophy that we apply. We build Coveo one customer at a time, one employee at a time, one great relationship at a time with a duty of care and trust, uh, you know, to uh, towards, you know, first, first and foremost, our employees. And then, and then that carries through to our, our, uh, our customers. And then last, our shareholders in that order. That's, that's kind of the order of things. And, um, and, and for us, it's, it's work. So back a full circle, back to your, your question, pardon me for the long answer, but no, not nerve wracking, certainly a lot, tremendous amount of work. We have a wonderful finance and legal team and uh, a great, uh, you know, a great team all around that, uh, that was able to execute that flawlessly. And uh, we're very proud of that. There's nothing that scares me more when I talk to a young entrepreneur and I ask them what their goal is and their goal is to go public. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, that's a really bad start to the conversation. Exactly. Um, you know, I, th- I think one of the things, I mean, you know, the, the, the words you just you just used, I think somewhere between philosophical and clearly a man that's had the experience to go that route before, uh, I think the ability to compartmentalize, um, you know, the the difficult world of capital markets and your personal life, I think, as you've mentioned, has been a big help in, in, in maintaining the serenity and, and that balance that you have in life. And you mentioned hiking, um, but I know you're a family man and you spend time with the family. I mean, clearly you've you found a way to compartmentalize. And I, I would tell you that a lot of the very successful uh, entrepreneurs that I've met over the years that have gone public have had that strength, that ability to be able to say, there's a wall, there's a line and, and, and not drag everything home with them. Well, it, it, it's, it's, it's a business, right? And, uh, and, and there are things, you know, a, a business is important in the sense that uh, it engages people. You know, I, I, I've said a few years, I, I gave a talk to um, the Montreal Chamber of Commerce and, uh, and uh, some people still talk about that sentence when I said more people in Quebec and in Canada and, you know, probably across the world, should have that one feeling of, you know, maybe leaving the office last at night and, uh, you know, at 10 p.m., not not to say that I do that often, I don't, frankly, but, you know, when that happens and then walking around the office and seeing all the, the, the you know, the, the desks with the pictures of the babies and the families and the kids and, you know, all of that, and you feel that responsibility, right? And uh, the good thing about about building a business is, is, is the ability of a common project, um, you know, and purpose to engage a group of people towards towards a purpose um, in a way that respects a set of values. Uh, you know, you do it in an ethical way, you do it in a collaborative way, and in a way that we, we always say at Coveo, we cannot build a great company unless our people are well. I fundamentally believe that. And so back to your point, Mike, it, I think it's, it's, it's really... Um, it's really about keeping that balance, um, you know, the, the, the wellness, my own wellness, uh, and then the wellness of every individual in the company, uh, you know, in, in fueled by that balance, in fact, uh, that we can keep, you know, um, impacts, you know, the, the wellness of the firm and the creativity and all of that. You know, when, when I ski on the weekend or go hike or bike or whatever that can be, you know, could be carpentry or sewing, it doesn't matter, um, or playing the piano. Um, you know, something happens in the brain, I guess. You know, you, you think, you still think about it, and that's how, you know, 
people become uh, become creative, right? Uh, you get a lot. You you don't get ideas, you know, uh, in the meeting from nine to ten on Wednesday morning. You know, it's just not how the creative process works. And then if you combine that, you know, I'm a firm believer that creativity happens with uh, human collisions. Innovation happens with human collisions of diverse people who think differently, come from different backgrounds. You know, if you put people in a room who all look the same, talk the same, have the same background and so on, you won't get a lot of innovation in homogeneity. And so if you combine that mix, so there is a bit of a, there is a bit of a thought process and a philosophy behind building, I believe, any, any um, you know, durable, uh, solid business that uh, we try to, um, you know, and, and, and oddly enough, I focus more on that than on the actual, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the dumbest guy as it relates to technology, to be honest with you. Well, most, most successful entrepreneurs have surrounded themselves with people that they say are significantly more intelligent. Than oh, you always you want, that's, you that's always the way want to go. The dumbest guy in the crowd. hundred percent. Guarantee that it's so much better to be exactly. the dumbest guy in the crowd. So you're, you, you segued into my next question better than I could have, which is this whole discussion of teams and, and culture and uh, employment and in a world that everybody's complaining that they can't find talent right now or the right <coughs> talent. How is, how is Coveo dealing with staffing and, and engaging and trying to maintain a culture in an environment that is less than optimal? The environment is clearly less than optimal, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, I will say in our case, we saw it coming, you know, we ran Taleo, which was the largest employment um, uh, uh, platform on the internet in the world. Um, and so we knew uh, back in 2008 that it was already full employment in the digital world. I'm, t- I'm saying 2008. And we told that to the government at the time because we had the big data. And the reason we knew that is because companies that were posting, um, you know, job openings uh, in the in the digital world were not getting candidates, um, you know, to to a higher. You know, they were getting candidates at a much lower rate, obviously. And yet, you know, um, again, uh, you know, we continued, uh, you know, as a society to um, uh, sort of try to give away our talent and et cetera. So what we created, in fact, is an environment where we imported the inflation and we imported the scarcity of talent to a degree. Um, And so companies like Taleo and Coveo became the farm team, Uh, you know, were the farm team for Facebook, were the farm team for Google, et cetera. So obviously we had to learn to fight back. Um, and, uh, and, And, you know, one of the, you know, that is one of the key attributes of being a public company is, uh, you know, you can grant, you know, restricted stock units and, uh, and uh, things of that nature. There, there are some instruments that being a public company helps you to do in addition of, to capital and in addition to scale. And, uh, and so suddenly you have the means of your ambitions, but it, it's, 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 really, uh, it's really difficult uh, to compete. Unless then you complement that with another dimension, uh, which is really that dimension of belonging, of, of, of uh, you know, participating, I think. Uh, and, and I'm not suggesting a Coveo or any other company is necessarily made for everyone. But, you know, <clears throat> we're very clear about our ambition um, to be a leader, to be the leader in our space. We believe there's only room for number one in technology. So in everything we do, we seek to be number one. It's pretty simple. So not a big number to remember, it's number one. And, uh, and, and by a certain set of metrics and, uh, and, and et cetera. So we wanna be a leader. Uh, we want growth and, um, and, and we wanna do it, you know, uh, we, we choose our value systems. There's many things we can't predict, but you know, the things we know is we know our value system. We know we wanna be a leader. And we know we want to grow, and we know by how much, and uh, and and so that that's kind of the that's kind of the the rule, and uh, we make that very very clear. And 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 the employees who want to participate in that, um, you know, uh, I guess I guess for them it's exciting, and uh, you know it becomes you know the very important dimension that uh, is is I guess becomes hard to find elsewhere. But again, we, we've never pretended that, you know, we're the only ones, um, you know, um, we think we're, we're a, a pretty darn good, if not great company. 
Um, we think the future is pretty promising uh, for our business, given, given what we see and what we do and the value we create for customers. Um, and, and we think, you know, there's a lot of benefits in, um, you know, on, on an individual level and individual growth to participate in that in, in the building of a leader. Um, and then people make their own choices, right? Yeah, there's, we can't do more than that. Yeah, the last question I'm going to ask you is an interesting one. I think if you would have taken a company public 10, 15, 20 years ago, you had pretty much one bottom line. Today's world, I feel like we have two bottom lines. We have the financial bottom line that's important to the investors and the shareholders and the stakeholders, okay. yet we have the bottom line as well for the employees. And that's a different definition of profit and success. Right. Um, how do you, how do you balance those two? Yeah, well, uh, I'm very much with you there, uh, and I think I think it's not just for the employees. I I, I think at the end of the day, it's uh, it's it it co- it goes back to the purpose. You know, the purpose is much broader than than what it used to be. Um, we're certainly very proud at Coveo. I don't know if you 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 might have seen that or missed that, but upon IPO, we pioneered something in Canada, which is the one percent pledge. Um, so we pledged uh, 1% of our employees' time, 1% of all our worldwide um, AI platform and data processing capabilities and products, 1% of our profits when we gained the, that operating leverage. But last but not least, the investors of this company have pledged 1% of the entire company equity um, you know, in, in, in a fund and you know, in, in, uh, in, in the structure of an endowment to actually, and, and we think... Our cause is, you know, we have obviously several legs to our ESG strategy, but uh, the big one um, on on the S side is we think that 5 billion people on this planet don't have equal access to uh, knowledge and education. And we think knowledge and education is the ultimate uh, equalizer. And that because somewhat linked to our capabilities at Kaleo, we can, um, you know, we have access to data, to knowledge, we can unlock it and we can deliver it, you know, personal, you know, anywhere in the world to any individual. Uh, we think we can contribute to democratizing knowledge and education. And, uh, and you know, I think, I think the employees, so we have, you know, six committees, 80, 80 of our employees participating in that and uh, building that and so on. That's exciting, um, you know, and, and that goes full circle back to what I mentioned before, which is a, a, a company is a project that, you know, engages people. And, um, and, and when that's the focus, as opposed to money and so on. If you do that, again, the, the destination for shareholders will be better. If you focus on that journey, the destination for the shareholders will be better. We have, we're lucky we have shareholders who understand that and understand the set of priorities, which is number one, employees, number two, customers, and yes, shareholders, you're gonna be number three. Because if we miss on the two first ones, <laughs> you're not gonna get anything anyway. And, um, and, and so, you know, as long as you understand that, so, so yes, um, you know, the bottom line, as you said, uh, Mike is, is much more than uh, obviously just, just, you know, the earnings call for, for the shareholders, obviously. Louis Tetsu of Coveo, hang on, and we'll, he, he'll be around for his one piece of advice. Uh, for today's entrepreneur that's on the way and a hiking recommendation too. We'll get to that as well. But first, let's talk to our expert. This time, it's Sarah Hallickman, partner of Estates and Trusts at FL Fuller Landau. Sarah, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. And Mike, uh, certainly a lot of planning goes into Estates and Trusts, a lot of documents wrapped up into business, and this could be several months, uh, sometimes years of work. Yeah, and it's the type of thing that needs to be considered far enough in advance uh, for any kind of planning that you're going to do. So, I mean, I, I, nobody better to explain it, I guess, Sarah, than, you know, what is an estate freeze and, and when would you consider doing one? Right. So um, an estate freeze is really one of the most common estate tax planning strategies we use for business owners. Um, and to understand why, we kind of need to take a step back and remember that upon the death of an individual, that individual is deemed to have disposed of all of their assets at that at their fair market value as at that date. Um, and those dispositions ultimately create capital gains, potentially capital losses as at that date of death. Um, and then they'll be tax owed on those gains. Um, so in most cases, it's quite easy to figure out the value of assets, you know, of, let's say an investment portfolio, a home that's maybe owned, even an RSP or a RIF. Um, and we can kind of figure out the gains um, on those and figure out what the tax owed will be. Um, however, in the case of private company shares, um, obviously the valuation is a little bit more complicated. The cost base can often be low or 
no nothing really. Um, and that means that the taxable gain on that disposition upon death may be quite significant. Um, it's also not generally so easy to sell shares of a private company, um, even if they are sellable, could take quite a long time for that transaction to close. Um, so upon death, a business owner is essentially left with a large tax bill for these private company shares, but without um, any readily available cash flow to pay that tax. And that's when an estate freeze comes in. Um, an estate freeze allows us to freeze the value uh, that's currently held by that shareholder. Uh, they exchange that value in essence for preferred shares that have a fixed value. And that allows us to plan for, um, you know, an ultimate tax bill owing upon their passing. And it also allows us to attribute uh, the future growth of this business, assuming, you know, this business is going to keep operating. The future growth can then be um, transferred to the next generation, whether that may be children or grandchildren, other family members, by way of issuing new common shares. So j just to clarify, you're, you're using these in intergenerational tax planning maneuvers when there's a when there's a, a family member that, or someone that you're going to pass the torch to within that business and and you're basically setting the groundwork today for future growth to go elsewhere so that you know what your tax bill is more or less absolutely. at this point absolutely okay um and i mean ob obviously what are some of the other considerations that, that need to be taken into pl place here i mean you're not going to you can't do it at the estate freeze three days before somebody passes and the, you kind of loses the uh, loses the effect so what kind of timing is here and what you know who, who who should you be talking to exactly so um look there's a lot of benefits to an estate freeze obviously every family situation every business situation is very different and we really can't give like general um yes everybody should do an estate freeze um you know, the particular situation really needs to be taken into account. Um, and that being said, so firstly, you know, a few things to consider. First and foremost, this shareholder who's going to freeze his shares, is he ready and willing to hand off that growth to somebody else to not necessarily be the person who's going to benefit from it? Um, you know, and at the same time is the value he's freezing, you know, does he have enough wealth for the rest of his life or his assets enough to kind of cover him? Um, if, a, you know, this shareholder is quite young, it really might be too early in the game to forego future growth. Um, sometimes in those situations, we could consider a partial freeze. Um, and then there's the aspect of control, you know, is this person ready to relinquish, con potentially control some ownership of their business? Um, you know, is, is it really the right time based on that? And um, you mentioned the timeline. So um, for an estate freeze to be beneficial, especially in transferring that future growth to future generations, you know, if let's say we know there's um, a third party sale down the line, well, we can't do the freeze right before the third party sale. Those new shares will have no growth because no time has passed. Um, so really for an estate freeze to be valuable, the business needs to have enough time for the value of it to grow, for there to be a gain attributed to those new growth shares, um, for it to be worthwhile to go through the transaction. So it sounds like you need your tax practitioner, your BVAL person, and possibly the psychologist to deal with the uh, the family business uh, interactions and who's getting what. So uh, sounds like right. a sounds like a full group that's required in this exercise. Thanks, Sarah. No problem. Sarah Halligman, partner estates and trusts at FL Fuller Landau. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks so much. And at the end of our show, we turn to our profile, Louis Tetsir of Coveo, and we ask him, sir, for your one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur. Well, my first piece of advice would be never to give advice uh, and let people let people think. Uh, but that being said, uh, I'll talk about beliefs uh, as opposed to uh, to to advice. I think I think if you're building a business. Um, you need to understand, I, I would say, I would say business about three things. It's about purpose, understand, you know, make sure you really understand the purpose and what's the purpose beyond yourself, uh, you know, beyond the company, what's, what's bigger than you that, you know, what purpose do you serve that is bigger than you? Number two is care. It's, it's, it's duty of care. Uh, you know, if you care about your employees, if you care about your employee, actually, if you care about your employees, your employees will care about your customers. It'll not, not the other way around. And, uh, you know, meaning that if you don't care about your employees and you say you care about your customers, it's not going to happen. So duty of care towards employees, customers, and all the stakeholders. And number three, it's about trust. So it's really a focus on people. Um, you know, building trust, trust among, you know, fostering a climate of trust among people. 
and uh, that goes, you know, squarely against, you know, micromanaging or or uh, any of that, you know, or the fact that maybe hierarchy is is um, is is a system for ownership of uh, of the truth and uh, so on, you know. Um, you, you never want to seek in a business who's right. You want to seek the truth, and uh, and empower people to trust themselves and trust each other and uh, and so on. So purpose, care, and trust. Focus on people, and uh, the rest tends to take care of itself. One last quick piece of advice: your favorite hike in Quebec, because I'm a big believer in entrepreneurs uh, getting out in nature at the end of a week. Well, many. I would say uh, Saint Surbain in Charlevoix is uh, is a beautiful, beautiful place. But uh, I don't have that much time. Uh, I, I I try to climb. Uh, uh, don't laugh, but it's simple. Mont Saint Anne every weekend, and uh, so that's that's sort of what I do both with uh, the skis and uh, the, the, the skis with the, the skins or, uh, or uh, just, uh, just regular hiking. So Excellent. Thank you so much, Louis. I got to say, Dan, I have one regret in today's show, and that's that we're not a two-hour program this week. Uh, Louis, I could go on for uh, at least another hour with you. Uh, fascinating uh, and, uh, you know, also heartwarming in the sense that, uh, you know, we're talking about Quebec Inc. We're talking about trying to keep people close to home. We're talking about people and their families. Uh, you've done a lot of things. And as I said earlier on, uh, you should be a proud man for what you've accomplished uh, and not only on the bottom line, but as you continue to move forward. So thank you for your, uh, your time. Good luck on the, uh, the, the your two month, two and a half months, I guess, into an IPO. It's, uh, it's not always going to be rosy. So uh, I know the uh, 2021 was a rough year for tech companies on IPOs, but I think your, your earnings call did a nice job this week. So congratulations. Oh, thank you very much for uh, your kind works, uh, words, uh, Mike and Dan. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And Mike, another tech company next week on the show, much newer. It's Ava, the Quebec co-op rideshare. They're going to be profiled on the program next time. Reminder that you can subscribe to Today's Entrepreneur as a podcast on iHeartRadio, iTunes, or your favorite platform. And you can also log on to the website, todaysentrepreneur.org, for hundreds of local entrepreneur profiles from the last 14 years. See you back here next week. Bye-bye. Talk.